also been a leader of this aquarium since the beginning. He was on the founding board and he continues on the board to this day. You're in the Honda Pacific Visions Theater. We can simulate in this theater the sights, sounds, and smells of the world ocean. We can add fog. We can tilt this disc up for a, as a projection screen, and we can make your seats shake as if there were an earthquake. If Russ Hill has all of these under his control, uh, <laughs> and, and so I can't predict what he will, he will do. Earlier today, I gave a talk at Long Beach City College in their senior studies program, which is it's led by a 90-year-old woman who's a remarkable woman. There was one person there, a woman who was 102 years old. She was the oldest one there. And it was quite a remarkable opportunity. And they're vibrant. And one of the things that I think we'll talk about is staying engaged and, and keeping a, a lively mind, things you're interested in are all key. In a minute, I'm going to introduce Russ Hill to you. Um, but let me just say also a word about our Spring Aquatic Academy. Because tonight, and then for the next three weeks, you're going to be hearing about how we're living longer, healthier lives. And in the spring, we're going to look at the planet. The planet's not doing so well. The planet has a fever, all kinds of ailments that are becoming more pronounced. And the health of the planet has a distinct em emphasis, em effect on our health. And we're going to explore the two of those and to look at their intersections. But now let's look at longevity. And uh, please join me in welcoming Russ Hill. And Russ, does this mean with longevity? Do, do I, is, is there a chance that I could, could amount to something yet with longevity? <laughs> I don't know, Jerry. Another 20, 30 years, you might make it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Do we have the uh, next show up, please? Thank you. Uh, this is sort of the backdrop for what we're going to be saying. Um, I've always liked Willie Nelson, and, and uh, I think he has a lot to say. Most people, when they think about uh, longevity, uh, conflate that with, uh, with aging, and they think about generational uh, uh, issues, and they think about uh, uh, the problems and the costs of aging. But basically, uh, longevity is a two-sided coin, and there really are uh, some risks and costs and burdens, but we like to think about all the dividends that come with, with uh, longer age. And that's really going to be the thrust of what we're talking about uh, with the longevity um, narrative and with the Aquatic Academy for over these uh, four sessions. Some years ago, uh, we did this uh, particular slide, and, and the idea was that longevity risk was much larger. It was the elephant in the room, and you had you know, some investment people debating active and passive. What this really is intended to mean tonight is something different, and that is longevity is worth it, and you can decide whether you want to be an active participant or a passive one, whether you want to let things happen to you or you want to take charge of, of your own health and really your own ability to expand your health span. Good Irishman George Bernard Shaw said it best, um, life is not about finding yourself, life is about creating yourself, and now you're going to have a long, long time to do that. So really, we're talking about the longevity narrative. And people uh, generally don't have a framework to think about longer lives and all the options that might be available to them. This is something new uh, for all of us. Increasing longevity greatly increases the dispersion of possible outcomes, uh, health, financial, uh, life satisfaction, all the things that you can do. This clearly includes opportunities. And opportunities are enhanced by understanding that those opportunities, in fact, exist and the implications of them. Additionally, we find that most people don't know just how much of increased longevity and increased health span is really influenced by their own actions. Uh, just as demography is not destiny, genetics are not the only controlling thing in, in what your own lifespan and health span are going to be. In fact, for most people, it's a relatively small part of, of the, the, the issue. We also believe that most people lack a longevity narrative. 
Uh, you saw the, the title here is changing the narrative. Most people don't have one. If they have one at all, it is really that aging is what we're talking about, and it's not all we're talking about. Longevity really begs the question, how would you reimagine the course of your life or that of your children and grandchildren if you realistically could expect to live to be a productive and healthy age 100? What would you do differently? I'm going to come back to the night speaker in a moment, but I want to take just a moment to talk about the, the succeeding ones. First off, uh, remember the other three sessions are going to be on Thursday nights. This is, a, this is an outlier being Wednesday night. Our second speaker, he was so popular at Russell Investments that they said about him for three or four years after he retired from full-time work that he was still the global co-head of consulting. He's a wonderful speaker. He has a blog called Life After Full-Time Work, and I think you'll enjoy hearing how that process took him from traveling around the world being a, being a consultant and speaker to now focusing on happiness and having a great time. We all know those extra, those extra years need paying for, so the next speaker, Steve Vernon, will be talking about how you pay for retirement, but also how you build a personal portfolio, which is so important to get the life satisfaction that you want to have. And then finally, uh, at the end, Bill Burnett, who is the principal author of Designing Your Life, uh, is the one that, that helps you figure out what it is you want to do and then to take action to get there. He's the head of the design school at Stanford, and it's a wildly popular program. Each of those will be, uh, those will have books attached as, as you've come in and seen tonight. If we miss the number of books, because we can't figure how many people are coming each time, we'll take your name down and we'll send you the book. Okay, now to the main event. She's ready, I can see that. She's ready to jump out of her seat. Globally, increasing longevity and aging societies are coming to dominate uh, financial markets, government energies. All of us need to understand that regardless of our own circumstances, these changes are going to affect us through public policy, through taxation, through health care costs, any number of things. At the same time, there are enormous opportunities, and I, I really couldn't imagine starting this series with anybody but our speaker tonight. Laura Carstensen is a professor of psychology and the Fairley S. Dickinson, Jr. professor in public policy at Stanford. She was the founding director and still the director of the Stanford Center on Longevity. In her book, you can see the cover, and you, most of you have it, A Long Bright Future, um, we gave it out as client gifts some years ago, and it really got us started in the longevity track. Her research has been supported continuously by the National Institute of Aging for more than 25 years, and she's currently supported through a prestigious merit award. She's in the National Advisory Council on Aging, the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Aging, and in 2016, she was inducted to the National Academy of Medicine. There's a lot of other things I could say, but rather I just say welcome. Come on up, Laura Carstensen. Thank you, Russ. And thank you all for being here. Jerry Schubel, thank you for your graciousness to me and, and this visit, and um, uh, much more so for your oversight and care of the aquarium. What a fabulous place and what it's doing for the world. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've had the good fortune of knowing Russ Hill now for over a, a decade, and um, uh, he works with us at the Stanford Center on Longevity as a member of our advisory council, but also collaborates with us on, on multiple projects, and I don't know anyone in the industry who is more thoughtful uh, or more deeply engaged in the issues of longevity and really bringing them to the fore uh, to the population and how they think especially about their financial futures, but really how they think about their futures. So here's my plan this evening. What I would like to do is to offer a kind of bird's eye view of long life in the 21st century. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we got to this point where we're living now, uh, where we're likely headed, and why we so badly need a new map of life. Um, 
Can you imagine what your great-grandparents would have thought or how surprised they would be to know how long we're living today? Um, uh, I can make some guesses about this crowd here in this room, your background, your levels of education, your affluence in society. I'm just going to make some assumptions about who you are. And based on those assumptions, I can tell you uh, that the vast majority of you are going to sail through your 80s and your 90s, and lots of you in this room are going to live to be 100 and beyond. And your children, your grandchildren, uh, how many of you in this room have had a grandchild or a child since the year 2000? Born since 2000. Okay. Demographers estimate that the majority of those babies will live to be over 100. And there is one demographer in England who is making more specific estimates by country. In the United States, it's 104. So when you <laughs> look at that child uh, in, in your life, uh, uh, start picturing a, a centenarian. <laughs> um, now, to say that the changes that we're experiencing, the changes in life expectancy, these increases in life expectancy, are sudden is a gross understatement. Um, throughout most of human evolution, life was short. I mean really short. Uh, we don't know exactly what it was as we were evolving on the African plains, uh, but the estimates go from 18 to 20. Um, imagine that. It's just barely long enough to, to ensure survival of the species because you have to grow old enough to be able to reproduce and then hang around long enough to make sure those offspring can grow old enough to be able to reproduce. So it's touch and go. And as recently as 5,000 years ago, life expectancy was still 18. Now, Evolution acted on age. It acted in the way that evolution acts at a snail-like pace, and life expectancy gets a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer. Go from, you know, 3,000 years ago, go fast, fast forward 1,000 years, and life expectancy is 22. <laughs> Work your way up to the Middle Ages. We get to the mid-30s. In the United States in 1900, life expectancy was 47. At the end of that same century, life expectancy was 77. Today it's 79, and it continues to increase life expectancy in old age. So as you look at this image, you see that we added more years to life expectancy in a single century, in the 20th century, than we added across all prior millennia of evolution combined. So in a blink of an eye, we nearly doubled the length of our lives. So if this aging thing, you ever feel like you don't have it quite pegged, <laughs> don't kick yourself. You know, it is brand new. I mean, true, in evolutionary history, there were a few who probably made it to old age, but they were a handful. And the change that we're living through today is a change where reaching old age and then staying in old age for decades, living out our full lives, the changes that that has become typical. And that's an enormous change. Now, across the same years that life expectancy was going up so rapidly, fertility rates fell by half. So in 1900, the average American woman had 4.2 children. By the end of the century, it goes to 2.1. And those two phenomena together, increasing life expectancy by 30 years and having half as many children, those two phenomena together create aging societies. We, we could have had longer lives, but not aging societies. We just would have had enormously large populations. But these changes together redistributed age in the population. So as you see here, um, in 1900, about 4% of the population was over 65. These are US numbers, but that was pretty much the case in the developed world. To be, to, to be blunt, that means that 
the nature of old people and old age, how they're faring, if it's, they're faring well or faring poorly, doesn't have that much of an impact on society as, as a whole. There are relatively few older people. But those percentages rapidly changed as more and more people reached old age. So today, 14% of the population in the US is over 65, and that percentage is expected to increase to 20% by 2030. Now, we are the young kid on the block compared to other countries in the developed world. And Germany already, 21% of the population is over 65 today and is expected to go up considerably. That's more people in old age, a greater proportion in old age than we expect to reach at any point in the United States. And in Japan? Well, in Japan today, 28% of the population is over 65. And that percentage by 2050 is estimated to go somewhere between 36 and 41% of the population. It depends on fertility and how, whether or not the government can incentivize young women to have more children. Um, I was talking to some friends earlier this evening and said I know demographers who are taking bets on the year the last Japanese citizen will remain standing. <laughs> Populations are beginning to shrink in countries uh, around the world and largely because of this reduction in fertility. So how did this happen? <laughs> how did it happen and happen so fast? Um, well, in the story of how we somehow launched ourselves into this era of very long life doesn't really begin uh, with a story about old people at all. It begins with a story uh, about children. In 1900, 25% of babies born in this country died before they reached five. There were many families that didn't name their young babies because they were considered to be fleeting angels coming just to stay for a short while. Parents didn't want to get too attached because infant mortality was so high. Most families experienced the death of uh, a young child. And death was common at all ages. Uh, many more died, many more children died before they reached 12. Maternal mortality was very, very high. In fact, life expectancy around the turn of the century was shorter for women than for men, accounted for by deaths during childbirth. But people also died from contagious diseases or gastrointestinal diseases, usually foodborne. And so they would get sick at any age, uh, typically suffer for a couple weeks, go to bed, and die. So death was so common and so distributed across life that it wasn't particularly strongly associated with old age. People died throughout their lives. And in recognition of this, our ancestors in the 20th century, early on in the century, said that this was unacceptable, that the number of children we were losing was not right, and they went about systematically building a world designed to protect young life. Uh, we invested in science, medical science, to understand the causes of diseases and how they were spread. And with that, we worked hand in hand with public health efforts to then develop vaccinations so that we could inoculate young ones against diseases that they would never have to suffer. But it wasn't just medical science that contributed to this increase, this dramatic increase in life expectancy. In fact, some historians of the era write that you can thank your garbage, garbage collectors as much as your physicians for the longer lives that we're living. It was the systematic disposal of waste, garbage collection, that greatly reduced the spread of contagious disease. But we didn't stop there. We purified the waterways. We pasteurized milk and foods. We didn't stop there. We came to understand the nutritional needs of young children, and we built supplements into the food supply. 
We didn't ask individual parents to make sure they were giving these supplements to their babies. We just built it into the food supply so that the majority of the population was able to live healthier, better lives, and virtually eliminated within about 20 years in Europe and the United States, pellagra uh, and gout and other reflections of nutritional deficiencies. We developed agricultural technologies that allowed for the first time in history to have a steady food supply throughout the year. And we recognize that the reductions in fertility and the emergence of the Industrial Revolution meant that children had to be educated. We needed to treat children differently. And we put in place in every state in this great nation public education so that all children could learn how to read and write. And today, at some point during adulthood, education is a better predictor of life expectancy than age. And that is a stunning observation, a stunning change in the history of humankind. You know, we really don't stop there now. You know, we're continuing to invest in the health of young children. We perform surgical procedures on babies in utero. Uh, we're able to understand how children's minds are developing, even in utero. Think uh, Mozart played at belly height. We're continuing to try to understand how we can improve the, the well-being and the health of young people. And it was because of these efforts together that we began to reshape population pyramids into rectangles. So as recently as 1950, every state, every country around the globe had age distributed in the populations that look like pyramids. You had many young ones at the bottom winnowed to a tiny peak at the top. And the change that we're living through is that more of us are making it all the way through our lives, and so we're rectangularizing these population pyramids. Now, you know, if you're the kind of person who can get chills from biostatistics, <laughs> my people, you know. <laughs> These are the ones that should do it, because it was the investment in science and technology and well-being that is allowing young children to live out their full lives, first time in the history of humankind. Now, to our knowledge, lifespan, that is the capacity, how long can we live? To our knowledge, lifespan hasn't changed much over the centuries. We don't know how long we can live. We'd have to create ideal conditions. Uh, we, we know what they are in uh, fruit flies, Drosophila. We know what they are in earthworms. But we don't know what the lifespan of a human is. Uh, we would have to eliminate all diseases, all environmental toxins, all accidents. Then we could begin to see what lifespan could look like. So lifespan is a theoretical concept today. But we do know <laughs> that lifespan has to be at least 122, because the oldest woman ever to have lived, Jean-Louis Coma, died in 1997 at the ripe old age of 122. Now, if any of you are a little uneasy about aging, as I mentioned before, many of us are, you should know about her. Uh, she was a wonderful character. She lived on her own throughout almost all of her life. She rode a bicycle till she was 110. Uh, she made a rap album when she was 114. Um, she played herself in the movie Vincent and Me. Some of you may have seen. She was the only person on the planet who had actually met Van Gogh. <laughs> played herself in the movie. <laughs> And she had a great sense of humor. There are journalists would come to see her on her birthday as she got older and older. And there's one story of a journalist who asked the question of her when she was 120, what sort of a future do you envision? <laughs> Kalma just stares at her for a minute 
And she says, a very short one. <laughs> but my favorite Kalme story, hands down, is one about a property deal that she made at the ripe old age of 90. So she lived in the French city of Arles. She lived in the family home. And she'd lived there all of her life. And she had every intention of living out her life in the family home. But there was this 47-year-old lawyer. And he really wanted to buy the house. And so he would make her an offer. She would say no. He would go away. He'd come back a couple months later. He'd make her a better offer. She'd turn him down. And it went on like this for some time, for some years. But one day, he appears on her doorstep. And he says, I have a proposition for you. You already get a chuckle. <laughs> he says, I will pay you $400 a month for the rest of your life if you will deed the house to me on your death. She thinks about it. She says, OK. And they draw up a contract. And over the next 30 years, <laughs> this fellow pays her more than three times the value of her home. <laughs> they became friends over the years. And uh, he, he attended her 120th birthday party. And they were overheard talking. And she had turned to him at one point. She said, you know, we all make bad deals. <laughs> she outlived him by two years. <laughs> He died at 77, which was average life expectancy at the time. <laughs> That's what 122 can look like, just, just to leave you with that this evening. But these changes in life expectancy are the real story of the day. As I say, we don't know if lifespan has changed or will change, or even what it is at this point in time. The real change is that, on average, the odds of making it to old age have greatly increased over time. And it's an extraordinary cultural achievement. You know, you think about what went into that, from education to changes in social practices, uh, yeah, distributing uh, uh, inoculations, vaccination programs broadly in the population, changing nutrition. You know, it, it was a, this, this extraordinary cultural effort that resulted in this change. And you know, you might think that people would be happy about it. <laughs> but we continue to feel stress and strain. But the real situation we've created is that we're now living at a point in history where, for the first time, four and five generations will be alive at the same time. To put that in perspective, a 20-year-old male today has a better chance of having a living grandmother than a 20-year-old male in 1900 had of having a living mother. Again, this is extraordinary. This is an extraordinary new emerging opportunity. And as I say, you would think we'd be happy. You would think we'd be dancing in the streets. <laughs> More time. It's more time. More time to spend with our loved ones, to chase our dreams, to realize our goals. That's the gift we've been handed. No strings attached. More time uh, to live our lives. But the societal response and the individual response has been mostly concerned. We're worried. We're worried about our futures. We're worried about our health and our parents' health and well-being. Employers are concerned about dropping productivity as they have age, older and older workforces. And you know, I'd, I'd like to tell you that we have really nothing to worry about, <laughs> that everything's fine. Um, but there's a lot that we have to work on. We have a lot of challenges ahead in order to turn these added years into a gift. I don't have a lot of time with you this evening, and so I thought what I would do is to just make one chart that would summarize the research literature on aging. Um, you can put any variable you like on the y-axis here. <laughs> uh, social status, health, cognitive ability, and then this is age. 
and the findings, many of the findings in the literature suggest everything just gets worse <laughs> as, as we get older. <laughs> now, that clearly is the hypothesis that guides most research on aging. You know, that is what we are after in the research community. It's to compare younger and older people, and where there are differences, we assume that older people are not performing as well as younger people are, and that the model is youth, and that's really been the nature of science on aging. And as I say, there's a lot of evidence for a lot of problems, so I don't want to whitewash this, this, this uh, uh, body uh, uh, of literature. There are many challenges ahead, but when you only ask questions about what goes wrong, you don't generate information about what might also go right. And one of the things we've learned in recent years, I'd say the last 20 years, um, is that the more we understand aging, the more nuanced the story of aging becomes. And this steady downward trajectory that I just showed you really doesn't characterize clearly what's happening across the board as, as we grow older. And the other thing that we're realizing is the malleability of age and aging is extraordinary. And it's not random. We know what predicts healthy, high-functioning, long lives. We know what the risk factors are. We've also learned that aging itself is a moving target over historical time. I believe that many of the stereotypes about old people today have their roots in some relatively accurate judgments about old age as recently as 50 years ago. But it turns out that it wasn't age that was accounting for many of the problems that we saw. It was differences in education level. So if we go back 50 years, older people had very, little yeah, very low levels of education. Younger people were having much higher levels of education, so we saw those differences. Today, we see uh, negligible, if any, differences in education levels of people in their 60s and 70s compared to people in their 30s and 40s. So aging is changing. But we've also found, as we began to ask questions about what might improve, is that we found that older people are more emotionally stable than younger people are. That knowledge goes up with age, even though the speed of processing new information uh, may slightly slow. And we know that people who are educated and affluent, as I began my remarks to you telling you how long you're going to live, we know that people who have access to resources as they grow older do really well into very advanced ages. So let me show you some evidence for some of these findings that have emerged uh, in the last five to 10 years in the research literature on aging. Uh, one is about functional health. Now, I'm sure you see in your newspapers on a daily basis headlines about how aging populations are sick populations, that the, an aging population will have many, many more people with more diagnoses, and that's true. We will have more people who have chronic diseases like hypertension, uh, um, uh, high cholesterol, uh, arthritis, osteoporosis. We will see those levels of diseases go up in a population. If you compare an old population to a young population, you'll see more of these chronic diseases. Chronic diseases take decades to develop, so in a young population, you don't see much of them. In an older population, you do. But instead, if we, instead of looking at the number of diagnoses individuals have, we look at how well they're functioning, what we would call functional health, then people are doing quite well. So this is a survey that was done just in the last couple years by some colleagues of mine at Stanford and some other places, where they asked people from 55 to over 85 if they were in good functional health. And the way they posed this was, are you healthy enough to work? And the numbers of people who said yes to that are what you see portrayed here. Now you do see the percentage of people who say they're healthy enough to work decline with age. But I want you to notice uh, this, is it here? Yeah. Um, this particular uh, column here of people over 85 
more than half of them say, I'm healthy enough to work. That's functional health. They might have lots of diagnoses, but functioning is quite good. We have, since the 1970s now, observed declining incidence of dementia. Again, you'll see in your newspapers headlines saying, we can't afford all the cases of dementia that we're going to have in the future. Aging populations pose a threat. They do. So if the, if, it's the difference between prevalence and incidence. So if you have an old population, you'll have more cases of dementia in that population. But if you look by generation or by birth cohort, the, the, the incidence within a particular cohort is actually falling over historical time. And it's falling a lot, about 20% per decade. There was a study published recently in the New York Times reporting that between 2000 and 2012, the incidence of dementia fell by 24%. This is happening not only in the United States, but in other countries, mostly in uh, uh, Western Europe, where these longitudinal studies have been done. And they see the same shift in incidence. We don't know why, but the best guess so far is education that education may be uh, uh, operating here uh, in a positive way. So let me say a little bit more about education because longevity, the longevity story is, is very much intertwined with a story about education and what education does to protect long lives. I showed you a couple slides back, functional health in the general population. But here's a breakdown by education level. What you see here in this slide is also functional health. And in this study, it was uh, what you're seeing are the percentages of people who say they have no functional problems in day-to-day -day life. They pay their own bills, they drive their own car, they live in their own house, they can go up a couple flights of stairs, no problem. They say yes to all those questions. We call them in good functional health. That's what you see here. But here, it's parsed by education level. So what you see on the, in the red line are people who have uh, some college, graduated from college from four years. In the blue line, you're seeing people who had a little bit of college but didn't get a four-year degree. And in the green, you're seeing people who dropped out of high school. That's the functional health. And the story here, again, is interesting because if you look here at early in life, Okay, I'm not, there. There's not much difference in functional health by education and youth, relative youth. So regardless of whether you have a lot of education or a little education, people in their 30s are, are pretty healthy. And then if you get out here to 85, you're seeing a convergence again in functional health. Um, uh, even people with high levels of education are showing the percentages of people in, in excellent functional health uh, are, are declining. Now, 85 is well past average life expectancy, and most people, regardless of education, do have, usually it's on average three years of very poor health before they die. Uh, and so we're seeing this convergence out here, regardless of education level. Um, and that's probably because of closeness to death. And so far, death, by the way, 100%. So, so what we see, the real story here that we're seeing is in the middle of life. I mean, here, if you look at people in their 40s, uh, you, you've got you know, 15, 16% of people already in poor functional health at the low levels of education. But now let's go out here, let's talk about you. Um, if we go out here, uh, and people with relatively high levels of education, you go to 75, and nearly 80% of people are in good functional health. Again, it doesn't mean you don't have some kind of a diagnosis, but functioning is good. That seems to be the education story. Education has a major influence on, on how we function in our lives, how we solve the challenges and the problems that come with, with poor health, how we manage our lives and thrive regardless of uh, particular disease status. Education matters. 
Education has a powerful, powerful effect on how we age. Education predicts whether we'll be in the workforce or not. Um, by the time we're reaching early old age, this is a re these are, data are based on a report that was just released by the OECD uh, last month. And what you see here are p different levels of education. It's, it's measured differently in different countries. But you're basically looking at the high levels of education and the middle, and then this would be uh, not finishing primary school. And what you see here for all these different countries is whether or not you're in the workforce in the age range of 55 to 64, so just before what we would call retirement age. And across the board, what we're seeing is this trend where regardless of country, people with high levels of education are still working at much higher rates than people with low levels of education. In the United States, what we see here, um, we, that it looks like uh, roughly, uh, just in the, uh, if you have the low levels of education, it's just a little over 40% of people with low levels of education are still in the workforce of this age group. With high levels of education, about 75% are still in the workforce. So education is predicting how long people engage in the labor force. And let me say another word about labor force and aging workforces. Because we hear a lot about aging workforces, and I think that actually misses the more interesting nuance of what's happening to workforces. And that is that aging workforces in some ways mischaracterizes them, makes it sound like everybody's old in the workforce and it's all getting older. The, the real story is age diversification. We're seeing today already six birth cohorts in the workforce at the same time. We've never seen that before in human history. People didn't live long enough and stay actively engaged long enough to see that kind of mix of generations. That's what's happening in the workforce. And there's a lot we don't know yet about ways to optimize age-diverse workforces. But the bit of research that's been done so far looks like there is great potential to increase productivity because of the age diversity in workforces. There is a study done in a BMW plant in Germany where they compared work teams of different ages. There were some young teams. These are people who are assembling cars you have some young, that are all young people. Some teams were mixed in age, and some teams were all old. The finding is that the mixed age teams were the most productive of all. The young teams work very fast, and they make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> the old teams work much slower, and they essentially don't make mistakes. <laughs> you put the, the age mix together and you see higher productivity and fewer mistakes. And by the way, some other analyses of these work teams and um, automotive uh, manufacturing plants uh, suggest that yet when young people make mistakes, they're very expensive. <laughs> and the mistakes that older people make are not so expensive. Um, but again, you start to think of how we could create workforces where the knowledge and the wisdom and the experience of older workers is mixed with the energy and the enthusiasm and the novelty of entering in to, and, and addressing a new problem. You put those together and there's just considerable uh, potential. Now, there's a lot more work to be done in this area. It's not going to be true for every single workforce, but it looks like employers who begin to thoughtfully um, create environments that will um, optimize the contributions that people of different ages make will have much to gain. Okay, so let me give you some more good news, and this really is good news. Uh, the next set of findings I want to tell you about are, are ones about emotion. Um, these are my favorite findings to share with Stanford undergraduates. <laughs> because it looks like people get happier as they get older. 
And you know, these poor young kids, <laughs> not only are they miserable, <laughs> but people keep telling them, these are the best years in your life. <laughs> it's no wonder nobody wants to grow old. Uh, but it turns out in study after study that older people are more emotionally stable, have fewer negative emotions in day-to-day -day life, and are generally more satisfied with their lives than younger people are. Studies of wisdom that is solving uh, heated, emotionally charged problems uh, suggest that older people perform better than younger people when addressing those kinds of crises. There's also evidence that older people tend to be more grateful, more appreciative of life, um, uh, have stronger, better relationships socially and emotionally. Marriages get better over time. You, you see this decline in marital satisfaction <laughs> um, after about 10 years into marriage. <laughs> And then it starts to come up again. It seems to be related to the children leaving home. <laughs> At which point, marital satisfaction returns to honeymoon levels. So those of you who are still in the, in the mix, mix, mix of that. Um, so emotionally speaking, there's much to look forward to with aging. And there's also a resource growing in this country and around the world, in aging societies, where we have more people who are emotionally stable, able to solve problems, and so on. This is, this is, this is a resource we need to consider thoughtfully. So let me talk a little bit before I close about um, the potential of what's called geroscience in the 21st century. Uh, you know, up north, Silicon Valley. <laughs> You know, Google thinks they can do anything. Uh, they're, in fact, Google is investing heavily in uh, research on geroscience. Uh, these kinds of headlines, I think, grossly uh, uh, mischaracterize the kinds of advances in the science that is going on. To my knowledge, there is not a study out there that points to any way to generate uh, uh, an advance that would lead to immortality. Thank goodness. <laughs> Um, now, there have always, always been people in the field, ever since I've been in this field, there have always been a handful of people who have said things like the first person ever to live to be a thousand is alive today. Um, these folks, I mean, I know them, they're nice people, you know, but they, they, <laughs> they, they live, you know, sort of just outside where the buses run, you know, I mean, they're just a little... Um, that's not what's going on today. That's not the science, is my point. However, this is what we're doing, and I think it's probably the most exciting area of science that I know of. So as people age, the risk factor for virtually all diseases goes up. There's something about aging itself that's heightening our risk of getting sick contracting diseases, whether that's heart disease or, or, or cancer, uh, diabetes, our susceptibility to influenza. I mean, we see these risk factors going up as we age. And the National Institutes of Health, all 27 of them, are organized around specific diseases. So the lung disease institute, heart disease, you know, we have these different institutes and we're trying to find cures for specific diseases but the older you get, it's like playing whack-a-mole because, you know, you fix one disease and then you're just going to increase the odds you're going to die of another. You know, you, you, you cure cancer, you increase dementia risk, right? So, so what geroscience is trying to do is understanding that basic biology that's changing as we grow older and finding ways to slow that, to address that. And this is the science that often gets referred to in these articles that you see with headlines uh, like the Google Curing Death headline. Um, but this is exciting research. Senolytics is one line of research that's showing great promise. Senolytics refers to uh, a, a set of uh, small molecules that can target uh, senescent cells. So, you know, cells can only divide for a fixed number of times at the end of this uh, cell division life. Uh, the cell will either go on to become cancerous 
or will just kind of sit there. And for a long time, people thought they didn't do any harm. And today, they think they might be stimulating, sort of secreting some kinds of substances that stimulate inflammation and are making us sick. And the older we get, the more of these senescent cells we have hanging around in our systems. And what Senolytics is doing is trying to develop ways that they can go in and selectively destroy the senescent cells. In animal research, this is showing considerable promise in reversing the effects of aging that we see. There are other, effect, uh, other approaches like parabiosis where they can connect the, the blood supply of a young animal to the blood supply of an older animal and then see that animal function as well, that older animal function as well as the younger animal when injured over time. So there are these, these novel approaches in basic biology that may well improve our health in the future, in the not so distant future. Technology is also beginning to really address health in ways that will allow us to understand what's happening to us uh, related to different kinds of nutritional exposures, different exercise approaches, and so on and so forth. Today we wear these watches that tell us how many steps we walked and um, uh, how often we stood up. They're big, hunky things compared to the future. I think these are like the main frames <laughs> of, of yesteryear. In the future, <laughs> we will have flexible polymers tattooed onto our skin that will continuously monitor respiration and glucose and heart rate and a number of other functions, communicate that information wirelessly, have it integrated into a device that gives us feedback and says, you shouldn't have eaten that. <laughs> or you're going to get sick in a couple days. And it's that kind of technological advance that's going to help us improve um, our, our healthy futures. This is the promise now of science and technology early on in the 21st century. And you know, the potential is breathtaking. I would love to have a crystal ball and be able to say 50 years from now, what are we gonna be able to do? What will we know about our, our health and what will we be able to do to modify it? Uh, because it's gonna be stunning. In the meantime, <laughs> uh, we're learning a lot about nutrition we still don't know an awful lot about nutrition, but we're beginning to understand some approaches and how they may affect our overall uh, functioning and health. Uh, a caloric restriction is the one approach that seems to be able to increase life expectancy, the one dietary approach. Caloric restriction is a horrible thing to do <laughs> on a sustained period of time. So this would be cutting your caloric intake for, by about a third forever. Most people don't want to live that way, so it's not been terribly effective in humans, but what people are beginning to understand and the scientists are after is understanding what the mechanisms are that are allowing caloric restriction to do that and then find other ways to be able to, to, to jump over the not eating part and be able to get those kinds of benefits. It looks like time-restricted eating is having uh, uh, some, some substantial uh, effects both on, on, on basic biological indices and also on, on weight. That is just restricting the hours in which you eat but not changing how much you eat or the nature of the food you eat. Exercise. <laughs> There's not anything you can do but to improve your odds of healthy longevity than exercise. Um, at this point in time. There may be in the future. We may have drugs. We may have different kinds of approaches. We may know more, but right now, exercise is the best thing you can do for your heart, for your brain, and for your mood. Um, exercise has uh, profound effects on, on longevity and health. You know, we really need to keep our eye on the new approaches that will be based on some pharmaceutical intervention and we need to keep our eye on them mostly because of the potential cost of drugs like this that could conceivably limit the degree to which they can be distributed broadly in the population. People sometimes ask me if, I'm, if, I, stay, if, I, if I lose sleep over the prospect of immortality and I say no, 
because I don't see any evidence for it at all. I do lose sleep over the prospect of the disparities that we see in our society today becoming even worse. And that's what we could see if what we do is develop scientific interventions and longevity that are expensive and can let the affluent live even better but never make it into the broader population. In many ways, that is what longevity is, right? It's the accumulation of effects over time. So to the extent that disadvantages are cumulative, then longevity does present a real challenge. But let's think about the positive potential of longer lives. We have, for the first time in human history, an opportunity to redesign all of life, to rethink how we live our lives, from very early, from education, to marriage, to work, to retirement. We can rethink all of this because we've got extra time. We currently have this as a life model. <laughs> we get our education early, we work like a dog in the middle, have a family at the same time, and then if you're lucky, you make it to 65, you get a little bit of leisure for a couple of years and then you die. That's the model. <laughs> that evolved around lives where the average life expectancy was 50 and it worked. In fact, you don't have a lot of opportunity for flexibility if you're going to have life expectancy to 50 and you're going to perpetuate survival of the species, right? So this is the kind of model that has evolved around short lives, but suddenly we have long lives. And so we now can rethink how we want to distribute work and education and leisure throughout our lives and the potential to improve life, quality of life, is enormous, and we can begin to do that now. With Russ Hill's help and support, and Halbert Hargrove's support of the work at the Stanford Center on Longevity, we have just launched a major initiative we call the New Map of Life. <laughs> As we started this initiative, we thought, well, let's first write out, let's, let's say, what hap how, what's life look like now? And you're, when you're 10, 20, 30, when do people buy their homes, get married, uh, go to college, when do they retire, uh, when do they get sick? And so we, we just filled this map, this chart, with what happens in, in, in life now. And what we noticed is that a whole lot, like there's way too much going on here in the middle, <laughs> and then there's like nothing going on in these added years. <laughs> So we add 30 years to average life expectancy. What we've done is we tacked them all on at the end. Only old age got longer. And we're saying, we got problems. Well, we don't have to put all those years at the end. We can put them anywhere we want. The life course is a cultural construction. We can change the way we live. And as I say, this is the first time we've really had the opportunity to be able to seriously redesign it. So we have begun our work with experts um, beginning to say, what would the new life narrative look like? What do we do with learning and with work? How do families change? How does work change? How does, it, how does life change when we have four and five generations alive at the same time? What happens to bequests, financial bequests at the end of a life when your relatives are gonna live to be 100? Well, if you're waiting for the family farm, <laughs> You're not getting that till you're 80. So how do we think about these things? How, how do we rewrite, redraw the map, and then invest in the science and the technology that we need to get us there? That's the bold approach that we've been adopting the last year or so at the Stanford Center on Longevity and what we intend to pursue uh, over the next several years. The bottom line is that for the first time, we have the opportunity to rethink how we live our lives and to use these added years to improve life at all ages. If we are going to succeed, we must recognize that longevity is not about the elderly any more than any other generation. We have to realize that we can change the nature of human aging. We have to realize that, realize new approaches to tapping the human capital that's represented in older people.
people and ways to tap the emotional strengths and even handedness of an aging society. We have to think about how older people or multiple generations can contribute to one another in ways that benefit and extend benefits in both directions, but certainly from older people to very young people, children, and to their families. I started my remarks to you um, this evening uh, talking about babies, and um, I'm going to leave you with the same. Um, you know, the next time you drive by uh, a schoolyard and you see those little kids swinging on the tire swings and climbing on the play structures, I, I want you to squint your eyes just a little bit and see the first centenarians of the 22nd century. <laughs> They're here. They're living among us. And it is our job, I believe it's our duty, to build a world that will get them all the way through. I do believe that our greatest risk of failure is setting the bar too low. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I should have said this earlier, but she's here to take questions, and we will have uh, microphones out in the audience if you want to ask any sort of question related to anything she said. She's fair game. Okay. Please. Are you going to sit here? No, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to protect you. Okay. We can't really see out there very well. Do we have? No, I can't see anything. Good, good. Do we have any questions? Is somebody going back there? Uh, as you're starting out, why don't you just take a moment and expand a little bit about <clears throat> what you're doing on the new map of life with it, how the project's mm -hmm. set up and what you're going to do with it. So the, the very first thing we did um, was to convene a, a group of people, about 50 people, and they included architects, climate scientists, pediatricians, geriatricians, lawyers, uh, uh, human resource uh, workers. We, we brought people together, it's a really mixed group, and we said, um, ask them to envision what a high quality century long life looked like. What, what does a 100 look like when you're doing great? And the reason we started there is because we believe that you really can't achieve what you can't envision. And we think we're, you know, when we think about old age, a lot of us are just kind of bracing for the fall, not saying how could we be thriving, but how, I just hope I don't outlive my money or I hope I don't get this disease or that disease. And instead, what would the positive view look like? Because if we have that, then we can start to build the world to get us there. So that was a great fun meeting. You know that because we had this man here invited to that meeting. Um, but then it was just a great meeting. <laughs> People went away. We thought we really need to follow up here. So what we've done now is to appoint um, eight postdoctoral fellows to work at the center for two years to dig very deeply into one of eight different domains that really fundamentally needs to change if we're going to support long life. Domains like education, financial security, uh, work, intergenerational relationships, health care, health fitness. So we're beginning that work now. Um, and what we will do throughout this period of time is to continue to focus on changing the narrative in the culture globally and nationally so that people shift away from this focus only on old age and start to say what's the new map which we think is more productive um, and to then begin to get to the solutions for the changes that we need identifying what the science is that we need the new technologies the new business opportunities the ethics and we'll begin to address those kinds of questions more deeply throughout the project. Great. Did we have a question up in here? Yeah. I have a, a reality question. How can a drug or life extension technology not be expensive <laughs> if you price something for what it's worth rather than what it takes to make it? Well, right now, the 
best bet on the market is a drug called metformin, which is a generic and is very cheap. Uh, and it's cheap because it's a generic and it was designed for something else. Uh, the other drug that might, is another one that people are putting some money on the bets is rapamycin, which was also developed as a anti-organ rejection drug. So for a different reason, but it looks like it may also have these kinds of properties. So it's possible to develop something that could be relatively inexpensive. I mean, they're there on the market. Go ahead. Can I sneak in a mm -hmm. different question? Sure, you've got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> have you done any research that might lead to stopping age discrimination since we're all able to work a whole lot later? Yeah, oh, there's a great question. Um, there is research on age discrimination in the literature. I haven't done it, but the, and, and our center hasn't done it. Um, but most of it's just documenting that it's there. My, my expectation based on the psychology literature on discrimination is that once older people are in the workforce longer and are con working in work teams and so on, it will reduce age discrimination because we're gonna see that productivity goes up. Employers are really easily convinced by data. So employers are often saying they want graceful exits, they wanna move people out. Um, but we can turn heads with these studies and findings from the studies of, of increased productivity. So I think that's maybe gonna be the best way to, to go about it, will be just showing the benefits of having age diverse and older workforces. And, and some of that will also come with societal change uh, in the structure of, of retirement plans and healthcare costs and things like that, that has to change along with it. Do we have uh, back up in here? Are you doing any research in third and second world and how longevity is impacted there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, last week I was at a meeting, Russ was also at this meeting in, uh, of, on global longevity, global, global aging, and, and the aim of that meeting was to uh, uh, think deeply about parts of the world where we haven't seen this increase in life expectancy yet and ways that the developed world may be helpful to, basically by sharing the mistakes we made along the way to help young countries that are young today on average uh, age uh, better going forward. The prediction is, as you may know, is that um, by mid-century, all countries on the planet are expected to be aging populations. So we're gonna see this shift and those that are very young today, where they still have lots of kids and few older people, are expected to age really, really fast. So to the extent that we can share best practices on policies, uh, pension systems, work practices, education, I think we can do something to help. You, you might know too, <clears throat> I think it's within the last two years, both uh, in Japan and in China, their equivalent of the FDA <clears throat> as accelerated the approval of drugs that uh, treat chronic diseases. That is, that they, they've fast-tracked the whole process because they cannot afford the aging population. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of work around the world, a lot of interest at the government levels in dealing with this and with the question of ageism itself. There is a, a saying that the, uh, the West grew That's rich before it got old. Uh, okay but less developed nations today will grow old before they get rich. So that is the, the, the real pressure is on to find ways to be able to afford these longer lives. Another, there, then over here. Okay. Right here, okay. Yeah. Um, I actually met a scientist like back in the 80s and he was trying to, a physicist I think, trying to explain about the atoms. Everybody, everything has atoms in it. So he was saying, what reminded me is that he said, you know when you see a baby sit on a really old person's lap, how they perk up. And it's not only just the stimulation mentally, but he was saying atoms move faster in a baby and slow down with age. And so you actually are absorbing some of these atoms. Do you know of any studies that have been done on that? I don't, but I really like the image. Isn't that neat? <laughs> the image of the baby kind of speeding everything up. 
Um, right. You know, there's a lot of research uh, suggesting that intergenerational relationships are good for people. Uh, and, uh, and those benefits go in both directions, from old to young and young to old. I uh, so I, I think we do have great potential. Uh, to How many grandparents them. would agree with that? Anybody? <laughs> Your kids? Over here. Hi. It looked like the curve you had for Alzheimer's was going up, but I think you said earlier that the dementia rates were actually decreasing. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Yes, so age is still the greatest risk factor for dementia. Uh, what's happening is that fewer people over historical time are developing dementia. That's the, the, the difference, but it's still the greatest risk factor. That is, young people don't get dementia. Uh, essentially. So Some people think they <laughs> start with dementia and never get it. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one, one of the things, uh, and you might comment on this, that is that the, a lot of the medical research is in fact looking at aging itself as opposed to other diseases. Right. That's the big shift. The big right. shift that nobody's looked at before and, and is still pretty um, heretical within the NIH system of science, the idea that rather than focus on diseases, you focus on the basic s process of aging and s try to slow that. That's really new. In fact, uh, the World, <clears throat> excuse me, the World Health Organization uh, in July authorized a new uh, category of, of, of happening, the cause of death, and it's the first time aging without any disease is going to take effect in 2021, so that all countries will report on this so that you, in fact, could die of old age and will yeah. be able to have a different set of statistics. When, One of the things that would be good about that is if age is actually the, a disease on itself, then treatments can be paid for and research can be rewarded yeah. directly. Yeah. yeah, it's true that you can't get some of this funded for those reasons. It's not a disease. So if it's not a disease, you don't get research funded on disease prevention, right? right. Here we go. A, question, a couple of questions here. Do you have a mic over here? sort of the power of the workplace is moving down. You see what I mean? And that people like younger people, with they're better with this new stuff. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that's a trend that is likely to continue. How does that figure into this when you're trying to map out an yeah. extended work yeah. life? I think the idea that young people are good with technology and old people aren't is grossly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. um, it is absolutely <laughs> the case that we believe that in Silicon Valley, but I think it's wrong. So in fact, if you look at people who are old today, they live through more technological changes than any other generation ever has. You know, from you know, you know, air travel, car travel, you know, I mean, just televisions, you know, I mean, computers. Um, it, I also, I, I think what's gonna happen with technologies also is that technologies are gonna come to learn about us and so it's gonna be less of us having to learn about a new technology every week, but technologies will teach us how to use them or they'll just respond to us and uh, with us being in a more passive way. So I, I think that's gonna change. I think the idea that young people are good with technology and old people aren't is very much a, a, a historical artifact that will change uh, in the future. And what about the automation? Well, Automation, and I think it's automation in part is why that's going to change, um, so that uh, we will have uh, we can be more passive in in technologies helping us. Uh, there's a whole story of automation and work, uh, and it replacing jobs. That's a whole different whole different story, and and I think that may well happen. Yeah, it, but even with that, when you think about the future of work. So there are two reasons why people work, right? There's money and there's meaning. And the money part, the economists I work with say, we can, we can fix that. That's a solvable thing. Uh, the meaning part is the harder one. 
So then you start to imagine what we do, the way we work now and how we might work differently. And there are lots of ways we might be able to improve our working lives by working a whole lot less. Yeah. I'm we have that. one vote here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to say, why not four day work weeks, three day work weeks? You know, I mean, there's a lot of, can <laughs> work be better? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I often say we shouldn't retire anymore. We should work at different paces and different engagement. And I'll often get groans in the audience when I say we won't, shouldn't retire anymore. And then I say, would you trade it for two or three day work weeks? Everybody would. You know, so we can work differently. Right. Another question. Okay, I, I, ha I have two questions. And, and to carry on this subject, the first one goes to an NPR article on this morning's news. Better, 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 the better, the better, fastest better. growing work group is people over 65. And the reason for that was because of the end of the defined benefit oh. pension plan and the for, going to 401ks. But my question to you is whether those people going to work over 65, if you would expect them to have a better, longer life as a result of being active and doing something they like? Two weeks ago, I would have said yes. <laughs> um, but I went to a, a meeting in Washington about work. And it's really, it's a, it's a complicated situation. Uh, so for in many kinds of work, and many, the kind of work that many people in this, in this theater do, it is really good for us to work. But there's an awful lot of people who work different types of work that is really bad for them, or in environments where they're exposed to toxins, there are accidents, there are... So it's really, it, it depends on what kind of work we're doing. Can work be good for us? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so we'll hope that they uh, benefit from that. My second question has to do with your chart that showed the, uh, the curves of, of disease as you age, and, and of all you showed, the most surprising thing had uh, shown up on that chart, which was a red line for cancer, because cancer after age 70 yeah. fell off, mm -hmm. where in the newspaper we're reading about all these people right. in their 70s dying of cancer. Right. So why is that? It's because some cancers actually do become less common with age. Um, and some cancers, cancers, it's, it's a third variety of cancers, and they have different trajectories. But cancer rates are still, the, the top two killers in old age are cancer and heart disease. So yeah. they're still the really major diseases of long life. Thank you. And, and back to the issue of, of, of equity and pricing of drugs, uh, you can still go for a walk. That's the most effective yeah. thing you can do. Yeah, that's really true. <laughs> yeah. Do we have, up here? Sure. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, when you started this discussion, you st we're talking about a new group you're putting together that is going to talk about how to fill that circle, that void. Okay. How long do you think that's going to take? Because I figure I got about 20 years left. <gasps> oh, those reports are going to be done in two years. Okay. So you, we're, you're fine. And by the way, it isn't just filling the old the, the, the last 30 years, we, we, want to read, we want to rewrite the map of life from prenatal to death oh. and thinking how we can, because we can put those 30 years anywhere we want, right? So what the, the questions we're considering is, you know, like how, how should we work? Should we work less but work longer? Uh, education uh, in, in long-lived, high-quality lives is going to have to be available throughout. We can't have all our education end at 20 and then say, now we're gonna work and do things till we're 80 um, or 90. So we need to redesign and rethink all of it, and that's the fun of, fun of this. Okay, so um, do you have a couple hints I could start with tomorrow? Some things to do? Yeah. Yeah, well, how much do you walk now? Not enough. Okay, yeah. Increase but I have it. a dog. But you have what? A dog. Oh, first I thought you said a gun. I was gonna say that's not Oh, God. <laughs> I have to say the thought has crossed my mind. <laughs> no. <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> uh, so here's a, a tidbit for you, is that dog owners live longer than cat owners. Oh, I'm going to get another one. <laughs> yeah. And people think it's because they walk. You have to take a dog out for a walk. You don't take cats out for a walk. So. 
Um, okay. But exercise is huge. Um, would, did you want more than that? More than just one thing to do? Uh, talk, I, I would, of course. Talk, talk a bit about, about uh, I, I just referred to it, but mm -hmm. the, the share of genetics mm -hmm. versus the share of everything else, behavioral things. Yeah, so people, the, the, the traditional parsing of how much of your aging is due to genes that you inherited from your parents and how much is behavior is that it's about 30% genes and 70% behavior. And I think that's a really old-fashioned and uninformed way of thinking about genes and behavior because genes don't express themselves in a vacuum. Genes interact with environments. And so we are learning more about that. But even if you have a genetic profile that may put you at risk for something, doesn't mean that behaviorally you couldn't do something that would address it. So, mm -hmm. so I, I that's that functional health idea that you know. yeah, and also you could let's say um, let's say you're heavily loaded to for alcoholism, and you decide you're never going to take a drink in your life. Guaranteed, doesn't those genes are never going to express right? So I mean, there are things we can do about how we live our lives uh, that will address genes. Yeah. Right. We had another one here. We have one here. One of the things I noticed, I mean, we're a fairly homogeneous group in terms of status and, mm -hmm. and education and pretty much age. <laughs> um, and age, did you say? <laughs> but um, within the country, I mean, there's a real diversity. I, I, I would not want to work at my age as a coal miner right. or an oil rig person or manufacturing autos. Um, I'm past that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, but, I mean, much of the stuff that, that middle America, so-called middle America complains about in terms of job loss is from automation, it's from lack of education, it mm -hmm. is from a variety of kinds of things, mm -hmm. and much of what you're talking about is about what can benefit sort of our group mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the people that support other things, things that, you know, mm -hmm. and programs that actually don't benefit them. So that's why I say with work, it's not a simple answer to say work is good for you. If you're a coal miner and you're, you're 55 years old, it's not good for you. Probably it's not good for you if you're 25 years old, but I mean, that's another, right? We need to have, we need to have in longer lives, we need to have on ramps and off ramps where we can take breaks, where we can relearn, where we can retool. And you're absolutely right that we need to be thinking about that and building it for um, the, the least affluent people in society, in part because the people at the most affluent levels of society, they're, they're going to find their ways in doing that. So we need to make these opportunities uh, available in the broad population. I'm completely with you. If we don't, then long lives just increase disparities. Um, but we can make these kinds of changes. We can make them uh, throughout. Um, it, it's going to take some thought about how we do it, and it'll be different depending on what type of work it is. But it can be done. I had, a, I had a question about the inadequate access to health care and mobility equipment. And we're not graduating enough medical school students who choose to become geriatricians. And that becomes a really big problem. One of the things that um, we learn in our business is that seniors tend to fall for a number of reasons, but one is a real simple reason. And that is because they lack the mobility to bend down to clip their toenails and then the toenails get overgrown, and they accumulate fungus, and then people fall. And it's a, such a preventable problem if we simply spent a little bit of money sending podiatrists to senior centers to trim toenails. I don't know if you can talk about that. Yeah. Not toenails necessarily, but talk yeah. about the overall. Yeah. Well, well let, can I talk about geriatricians instead of toenails? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, 10 years ago, there was this real panic that we weren't going to have enough geriatricians trained to serve the older people in this country. And uh, it, it turns out that that cry for help was completely justified, and we now don't. Uh, and we're not going to. So 
the, the solution to that, and I think it's the solution that we should have pointed to all along, is that all physicians yeah. should know yeah. something about aging. You know, the average age or the modal age of a patient in this country is 50, but we don't teach medical students much about aging. We need to teach all medical students about aging so that physicians know about how to treat people and differences in treatments by age. So we certainly need to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the falls, falls are the third most common cause of death in the elderly. Uh, and a lot of it is due to problems like you're describing pain and, and uh, uh, foot pain can make you unbalanced. A lot of it's core support, uh, core strength, I'm sorry. The, it, the, it's not so much legs as it is uh, uh, core strength so that when you start to fall, which all of us do many times a day, this is slightest, you know, we sort of veer off and want, right? But we can bring ourselves back. And what happens when core strength is lost is that you start to fall and you can't stop yourself. And again, exercise is something that will, will, will help that. I think of exercises, you, you, you know, peop, some people used to say, I think they don't say it as much, but it was something for young people to do. They're the ones that exercise. The older you get, the greater the demand is to exercise. Strength training and walking aerobics. Hi, my name is Val, Hi, Val. and I'm 76 years old. Great. And <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> my question, maybe it's an observation, has to do with the mental aspect of aging. Everything that it seems we've been talking about today has to do with something physical pretty much that you can do, whether you can endure those extra 30 years or if you can work. But my question is, doesn't that mental attitude that says, I'm not really getting older, I am going to push through and do things, isn't that very important as well? There are two characteristics that predict, predict length of life very well. One is optimism, and the other is conscientiousness. <laughs> and I think you're kind of referring to both of them there, right? Um, right. They are very important. The attitude we have about our lives is, is, is what motivates us to, to do anything that is good for us, right? Um, I, I could not agree more. It's really important. And, and the, the, I think some problems that older people face are because they think, well, I'm old. You know, I'm, what, what can I do? You know, life is over. And, Anybody who thinks that at any age is going to face real, real psychological problems, and we're not going to get things done. So, Do we have yes. one more over here? One more. Did, so, uh, did somebody? <clears throat> I heard that. Okay. Yeah, right here. yeah, sure. Um, I have been able to benefit uh, rather a lot from, without going into detail, um, the more advanced medical technology. But my question is this. Um, because you mentioned education as being a really good predictor. Have you looked at how, how much is our current state of medical technology, the, the things we can do to uh, keep a person alive and so on, mm -hmm. has that, does that have any effect on longevity or have you looked at it or what is going on with that? The increase in life expectancy in the 20th century was accounted for about, about half of that was accounted for by uh, the prevention of childhood deaths. Uh, but life expectancy kept going up in adulthood. And it was largely due to the prevention of second heart attacks. So it looks like we're still not very good at pre preventing something from starting in the first place. But there are technologies and stints and, and, and all sorts of procedures that can help people if they've had a heart attack, not to have another heart attack. So yes, medical technologies are doing that. And that's an old technology, the ones that, that, that I'm referring to. We're learning more every day with technologies, medical technologies that can help us. I, I think uh, Bernie Sanders just had yes. a stint, didn't he? So he's going to be back too. on the trail. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's it. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. Thank you. We'll see you Thank next you. Thursday. Thank you.